Here we go! Welcome to the Nintendo Power Zone, and now you're podcasting with power. This is a video cast slash podcast dedicated to bringing you the best Nintendo related topics. I am your host, Nice1983, and today's episode is all about new beginnings. Last season, we renamed the podcast the Nintendo Power Zone. This season, we are bringing even more changes, starting with our brand new P Wing logo. In Super Mario Bros. 3, the P Wing grants Mario unlimited flight. We here at the Power Zone will use this as a symbol of reaching new heights. Why is this P Wing logo so important? because it also represents another change. The logo was designed by one of three new co-hosts, or as I've taken to calling them, the Game Master's Council. Today's episode will be all about their introduction to this podcast, with some small Nintendo talk, but I honestly think that it's important that you, the audience, gets to know the new cast members and what they intend to bring to the podcast as a whole. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to the Game Master's Council. We have Jay Brilliant, Brendan, and Jaden. So guys, welcome to your first episode of the Nintendo Power Zone. Uh, let's start with Jay. Say hello to the new to the audience, guys. Hey guys, Jay Brilliant right, here. That's, that's the one and only JB. Then we have Brendan. Hey, what's up? I'm Brendan. Uh, I have the screen name Blues, B L O O Z, all caps. <laughs> and we have Jaden. Hey guys, this is Jaden. Thank you so much for having me on. A uh, nice one. Uh, but you can hit me up at Jaden Winsong. That's pretty much everything. So you find one, you find them all. All right. So what we're gonna do now is, I have written up some questions for the guys, and they're gonna go ahead and answer them each one individually. I'm really excited about this new cast. Um, Mario After Party was great, but you know he went on to do better things for himself. And now we have to do better things for the podcast. So, starting with Jason, tell us who you are, brother. All right, like I said, I'm Jaden, um, and uh, you know, Nintendo for me for me has really been my gateway addiction kind of addiction drug to to video games. My first console that I ever touched was an Atari. What was it? Twenty six hundred really old school system, but the first one I owned was a uh, Sega Genesis, uh, or in Europe they called it the Sega uh, Master Drive, I believe is what it was called. Um, and, you know, even having that system didn't hook me in the way Ocarina of Time did on the Nintendo 64. That was my first, first, first real Nintendo console, and since then I was, I was hooked. Um, it brought something to the table for me that nothing else could could really itch. Um, in terms of uh, my favorite console, uh, it, it's really hard to say. I'm loving the Switch right now, but I have I have very very fond memories of the '64 era. I mean, you had Banjo Kazooie, you had Perfect Dark, Jet Force Gemini. Um, a lot of classic Zelda titles. I mean, I spent a lot of time on Majora's Mask. It was a oh, fantastic era of gaming, in my opinion. Favorite Nintendo character, if you can't tell. Um, big Zelda guy. So, you know, Link is my boy. Uh, that, that, that's about right. Um, in terms of Nintendo waifus, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess... My, my, my favorite Zelda was Skyward Sword Zelda. Something about... Her character design really appealed to me. Um, favorite first party game? Zelda. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know how many times I can mention this, but <laughs> Zelda is my bread and butter. Um, favorite third party game? Hard to say. It, it depends on what uh, itch needs to be scratched. Sometimes it's Monster Hunter, sometimes it's Persona. I'm really big JRPG guy, so. Um, uh, a lot of pretty much everything Atlas publishes, I tend to, to tend to get from the get go. I know Etrian Odyssey Five is supposed to be coming out before the end of the year, and that's going to be fucking fantastic. I'm so stoked for that. Um, but yeah, it, it really just depends on on uh, what itch needs to be scratched. DBZ Fighters looks fantastic. I'm shit at fighting games, but you know, it's going to be fantastic. 
Um, oh, don't worry. I'm going to sit here and body all three of you in that. <laughs> I look forward to it. I'll get my ass kicked. Sounds accepted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, now back to what I can bring to the podcast, because that's important. I mean, Mari After Party, he, he filled a lot of uh, the channel, and so he's going to leave a big hole. And, and it's important, I think, for the viewers to figure out what, what I can bring. And, you know, I'll say right now I'm not good with artistic stuff. I can't do any graphics design. I ain't a music mixer. I, ain't, I, I can't do any of that stuff. But what I can bring is a passion to video games. I can bring uh, what I like to think of is as an as objective um, view on Nintendo and the industry as I can possibly bring. So I'm not going to fanboy. I'll call Nintendo out on their shit when they do dumb things. And I'll praise them to the roof when they do great things. But uh, that's that's what I want to bring. I want to bring kind of a, a intellectual uh, kind of spin on it. And so my goals here is just to uh, just to be able to to talk about Nintendo in a way that does them justice. You see, and these are qualities that. I was specifically looking for, and I, I believe each of these three new co-hosts does bring those qualities to the table. Uh, so, Jaden, really happy you're here because it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome to have you to conversate with on like some of the deeper level stuff. Uh, it's gonna be awesome just to go ahead and keep going in a forward direction with this podcast. And I just think right off the bat, you were an excellent choice to fill in a lot of the gaps that Mario After Party did because sometimes I can be that fanboy on this show. And sometimes <laughs> I'm, I'm not as analytical as I need to be. Sometimes I'm not as objective as I need to be sometimes because even though I do own all the major consoles, I think my Xbox One is in there collecting dust somewhere. I haven't touched this since <laughs> Resident Evil 7 came out. But all right. So welcome to the show, Jaden. I th honestly think... You're going to love it here, and I think the audience is going to love you. But now we're going to go ahead and we're going to move on to the one, the only, Jay Brilliant. Thank you for the very modest introduction there. Yes, my name is Jay Brilliant. Um, personally, I am a big gamer. I'm a big streamer as well. I'm a big streamer, but I'm, I stream a lot. It's a very big passion of mine. As far as why do I love Nintendo? Because it was a big part of my childhood, literally. The first console I got was the NES, and from there I was introduced to such games as Kirby, Zelda, Mario, and moving forward, the Super NES, the Donkey Kong Country series. Loved them. And I just kept rolling with it because this was good stuff. Nintendo has done some amazing things. Um, as far as my favorite consoles, uh, I have fond memories of the N64 um, but it's always going to be a tie between the N64, the GameCube, and the Wii U, because the GameCube was a very good, a big golden goose for them. And then the Wii U came out, introduced some very interesting concepts, the asymmetrical gaming stuff, and um, uh, I'm trying not to fanboy right now. I'm trying to keep kind of cool right now. Um, but yes, it, how the N64 has to be one of my favorite consoles because it has so many good memories of what we and my friends used to do together a lot after school and whatnot. Um, some of the games I really like, um, like Genre Rise, um, I do like action RPGs a lot, which is why uh, Legend of Zelda is, gonna, is one of my favorite games of all time. Um, favorite character, of course, is Link. I mean... It's hard to argue. Um, now, third-party games, and I had to think about this really hard. Actually, I didn't, because um, if this is no indication, Monster Hunter is the <laughs> shit, okay? And thanks to Nintendo, I got to experience how awesome it was on the Wii U uh, for 3 Ultimate, and I just kind of went from there. Kind of sad to see Monster Hunter leaving the Nintendo, like the newer version coming out for PlayStation. Um, Double Cross looked amazing. I lost my shit when I saw it come into the Switch. Just no Western release as of yet. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be waiting too long on a Western release for a Monster Hunter title. I don't think so, because, I mean, the fans are demanding it way too hard. And they just want it so fast, anything that comes up. 
And what I plan to bring to the Nintendo Power Zone is, since I'm a streamer, I plan to be a dedicated streamer to the channel. I am going to try and do day one of all the new games coming out for the Nintendo Switch. And I will keep you guys updated. I will gladly bring in you guys to play with me if the game has multiplayer. You can play with me, play with the rest of the cast of the Nintendo Power Zone as well. And that, my friends, is all I got. <laughs> all right. You see, and that's something that that's content that we wanted to bring. And that's why JB is here, because he came in here with the goal of he wanted to bring content. And content is key in building a brand, so that makes him a very important factor in what we're trying to do here. So it was much appreciated when I shot out the open call, you know, looking for new co-hosts. Uh, JB hit me up and he's like, I want to do dedicated streams. And I was all for that. I'm completely about that live. As you guys know, I do a lot of other stuff for the channel. Of course, I do the unboxings. I do breakdown videos. I do tons of editing, like tons of it. I spend about 72 hours on editing a week. Um, and I know lately my output has been a little bit less because we're focusing on the podcast. We're trying to make it a better branded podcast than it has ever been. So my output's been low, but I still put out six videos last week. Come on, guys. Don't give me crap anymore. I, I see my inbox flooded with crap. Come on, guys. Give me some love here. <laughs> All right. Anyway, but like I said, guys, I want you to welcome JB to the show. He is going to be an excellent addition. And last but certainly not least, we are going to bring you the man who designed the brand new P-Wing logo and has done an intro video that you guys should have seen at the beginning of this video when it's all edited and put together. I want to welcome Brendan, a.k.a. Blues, to the show. Welcome to the Nintendo Power Zone, Brendan. Thank you, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, so my name is Brendan. I, I go by the screen name Blues, as I mentioned before, spelled once again B L O O Z. Uh, usually all caps. And that's my Smash tag, and I'm making a more universal screen name kind of tag. Um, in Smash, I mean Mega Man, and in Pokemon, I mean Sceptile. Uh, Springman and Arms, which I need to get back into. Uh, I've just been playing a lot of Breath of the Wild recently, but that's another story. Um, I'm the youngest one on the show, which I think is cool because it provides some insights on the perspective of a younger gamer compared to, sorry you guys, but you guys are all old, so I, I, I prove that fresh perspective. I'm really stoked uh, to be on the show, interact with the listeners and fans. He's so great. Uh, so thank you, nice one. Uh, really cool to be here. Um, my reason for liking Nintendo, I don't really have one. Um, it's just sort of been when I started gaming, uh, this is sort of just where I was drawn. Uh, I've always, I had a PlayStation 2 growing up. All my friends had the GameCube, and every time I go to their house, I play GameCube for hours. Mario Sunshine, uh, Luigi's Mansion, uh, Melee was big. Melee was what really got me into all the other franchises of Nintendo um, when I played Melee at their house. Um, and it just, like, the more I played games, like on my PlayStation or at my friends' houses or whatever, uh, the more I just sort of was drawn to Nintendo itself. And became like, all right, my first console of the next generation would be always be the Nintendo One, etc. And blah. Um, my first Nintendo console wasn't a home console. It was the original Game Boy. Or maybe it was the color. I don't even remember. Um, but it was a Game Boy. I got it when I was three. It came with Pokemon Crystal. And I played Pokemon. I've been playing Pokemon since before I could read. It was really hard. It was a very text-based game. <laughs> um, it's surprisingly text-based. We don't give it credit for that. but. I couldn't leave. I couldn't leave my hometown until like three days later. <laughs> um, but so Pokemon Crystal was my first like game. Uh, but my actual, I destroyed my Game Boy playing it. I loved playing that. Uh, but my first actual home console was probably the Wii. I got it for Christmas one year, and I loved that so much too. Uh, my favorite genre is RPGs. I started with Pokemon before I could read, and I've been played every version of Pokemon so far. It's official. And moved on to Dragon Quest, tactical RPGs like Fire Emblem and Advanced Wars. Um, I don't like the new Fire Emblems as much. But they're co they're cool. I don't I'm not get into them though, unfortunately. I love Monster Hunter. Uh, it's been a, I, I passed out once. Okay, I spent all day playing Monster Hunter, <laughs> and, and I didn't eat, and I had to go do something. So I went there and I just passed out. It was awful because that just controlled my life for a while. And then Xenoblade like took eight months from my life. It was 
So I get really into my RPGs. Um, I don't have a specific... I'm like the whole spectrum. I just love them all. Um, up next, uh, my favorite character is Kirby. I know like everyone else is his Link. But like Kirby's cute. I can use him as a pillow. He can defend me. Like he lo- He's just lovable. He's the perfect combo of like lovable adorableness, um, power, and fun. Kirby's fun, dude. You know? um, so Kirby's my favorite character. Don't even get me started on Pokemon. I'll, I'll pick like six favorite Pokemon. Um, my favorite old, um, not even that old. My favorite series or like title from Nintendo was um, two Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul, Soul Silver. Uh, they were the, the definitive Pokemon remakes. Cause you had the Pokemon Follow You. It's like of some of the greatest. It was I started with Generation Generation Two. Um, and it just was so nice to play those, and it's always, they're the one Pokemon game I always go back to for, like, the perfect balance of everything and funness, but my favorite, like, newer Nintendo titles, probably Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, since Mario Kart's, like, the best friendship ender, that's whenever I throw a party, Mario Kart, Smash Bros, like, ending friendships all the time. Um, my favorite title of, like, my favorite first, or third party title is is actually not an RPG, and it's not. It's actually Scribble Knots Unlimited. I fell in love with the original Scribble Knots pretty fast, and just loved all of the rest. Uh, it's a it, surprise, but like they're so fun, they're so cute. Uh, you can do anything in Scribble Knots. I love that about it. I really love this cell too. This cell's a great studio. I know they're they've been going through some hard times. Their last game didn't get crowdfunded, and. They delay off some staff, which is super unfortunate. Um, but Jeremiah Salaska, uh, great. He's my favorite game developer. Uh, he's really cool. I like him a lot. He makes a lot of great games. Um, like I said earlier, I bring the um, I bring a fresh, newer gamer perspective sometimes um, to the show, which I think will be cool. And I think I just I, I, I like I said, or rather, uh, nice one said. I designed the logo and the intro. I can do some visual stuff with graphic design and animation, which I think will be helpful for making videos look cleaner and whatnot. And I want to get into streaming, just like uh, with Jay Brilliant. Uh, I have I have like no previous experience streaming, but it's something that now I can start doing in my career. Uh, now that I I have I'm in a good place in my life starting the podcast, and I think it'll be really fun to stream. And my goals so far uh, with the podcast are having a good time, getting to know the fans, the listeners, the, my wonderful co-hosts here. Um, I want a future in broadcasting, so I'm really looking forward to broadcasting uh, with everyone. Uh, it's my future. And, yeah, uh, so on the logo I made, it's the P-Wing because it's – honestly, it's just the P, power up, and then – Turned it into the logo for Power Zone. I thought that was cool. But yeah. See, see, what I loved about the logo when I initially saw it was how much it's very reminiscent of the logo for Nintendo Power Magazine as well. It's very um, simplistic in its design, but it, it speaks volumes. It's just like that old school Nintendo Power logo, and it even has like the three bars right next to it. I was like, that's perfect because mm-hmm. I've always visualized this podcast more as an audio magazine you know we break things down into sections we take so much homage from nintendo power like all of the segments that we do are based off of segments from that original magazine and just seeing that logo is like that is perfect and then the p-wing is such a great power up in general and it just got me thinking about like what the p-wing actually does and it like i said it grants that unlimited flights and it was perfect to showcase what we were trying to do with this new show, like, mm-hmm. you know, a new way to reach new heights. So I'm very glad to hear. And two reasons I brought uh, Brendan along was one, and I don't mean to be age biased, but his youth. Uh, in comparison to the rest of the group, he is the youngest. I'm 33, and the other guys are skewing into their later 20s. Um, so as we get older, you know, there becomes a divide between us and and the younger generation. So it made sense to bring somebody in who hadn't yet entered his twenties, who could give us a perspective that we hadn't yet seen on this show. Um, We've done a lot of interviews on this show and we're always interviewing people who are either 
my own age or older with Tom Kalinske, who is, you know, entering into his uh, late 60s. Mm -hmm. So I definitely wanted to bring a more youth-oriented uh, perspective to the show. All right. So, Brendan, welcome to the podcast. We love the logo. And, guys, I can't wait to showcase this new intro video. So you'll see that when this video is all edited. And it's going to look bri It's going to look all freaking right. brilliant. All right, guys. Um, Thank you so much. You're welcome. So guys, for any new listeners, anybody who this is their first episode, I just want to go ahead and I want to reintroduce myself real quick. I go by nice one nine eight three. Sometimes just nice one, sometimes just nice. Whichever you feel like calling me, it works for me. Why do I love Nintendo? Nintendo has been a constant in my life. Uh, for those of you who listen to the show, you know that I'm a military brat, so I spent my whole life moving from country to country. So Nintendo became a constant. Um, there was always video games to play when I didn't have friends. Uh, not that that was like a period of my life that lasted long. I'm very sociable, so I never really went without friends for too long. But it was also a way for me to engage new friends. Uh, games like Smash Brothers, games like Mario Kart, Star Fox, like the battle mode on Star Fox, uh, GoldenEye. I grew up playing these games with large groups of people, and it really made you know, me more sociable. Uh, before that, I was a shy kid, so I needed these things in my life. So Nintendo taught me how to love games, but it also taught me how to make friends. That's why I love Nintendo. So my first console was an NES. Um, before that, I had also played the Atari 2600. My grandma still has one, and it still works. And every time I go to Puerto Rico, you catch me playing some old-school Pac-Man. My favorite Nintendo console, it's a toss-up because... I love the Super NES. It is the you know Nintendo console with one of the greatest libraries of all time. But I love my Wii U because the Wii U has the best versions of all the games I love. Best version of Mario Kart up until the DX version. Best version of Smash. Best version of any game that you grew up playing. The best version is on the Wii U. Uh, my favorite fighting genre, you guys should know this, fighting games. You know that I'm a competitive SOB, and I make it a point to try to body every single person I play. And if you guys want to unmute your mics to say something, now's the time. I'm absolute trash. So if you body me, just letting you know, it's uh, I'm garbage. <laughs> hey. uh, fight me in Puzzle, Puzzle Fighter 2. All right. Bring it on, son. All right, cool. Pokemon comes out next month, mister. Oh, true, true. <laughs> Your body with that... I'm going to bring that crow gunk to the party. I'm going to bring uh, Empoleon to the party. <laughs> I got my septile, but that's it. Does uh, <laughs> anyone play Blaze Blue? I used to play yeah. Blaze Blue, but that's the so, only fighting game where I'm garbage. Uh, I've got a terrible joke for you. Uh, what kind of car does uh, Jin Kisaragi drive? I don't know. A knee song. Oh, that's messed uh, up, dog. That's driving. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible, right? Oh, yeah. That's awful. Yeah. Awful joke. One of my favorites. Sorry, I'll, I'll try not to make terrible jokes. <laughs> yeah. No promises, though. All right. So my favorite Nintendo character is actually Yoshi. Uh, I don't know. I think it might just be the product of the game that he was debuted in. Uh, Super Mario World is actually my one of my favorite uh, Nintendo games of all time. So just that that introduction of that character and what the character evolved into after that, because it, he went strictly from supporting role to, you know, starring in his own games and whether or not they're good games are debatable, but those are games that like I've played with, you know, girlfriends. And those are usually the games that I'm able to draw people in with, except my current fiance who I drew in with Splatoon of all things. Um, it is what it is. Uh, as far as my favorite first party game, it goes without saying, is Donkey Kong Country. Uh, I would never have classified myself as a gamer up until the point of that game. And when that game came out, my mind was blown. I remember I had subscri a subscription to Nintendo Power Magazine as a kid, and they sent me a VHS tape. And if you don't know what VHS tapes are, you are super young, and you need to get on Google and look that junk up right now. But they sent me a videotape. 
and it was the making of Donkey Kong Country. What it really was was a 30-minute fluff piece for Nintendo to blow eight-year-old Dennis's mind. Um, and I wanted that game so bad, and I begged, and I did so many things to get that game, and I got it. And the moment I played it, I was instantly hooked. Uh, my favorite third-party game, Street Fighter. Again, I'm super competitive, and I grew up in arcades. I spent a lot of times in arcades as a kid, so I learned the hard way of the way of the body. I learned how to get bodied, I learned how to deal with getting bodied, and then I learned how to body people back. So Street Fighter is king of the fighting games. You can say what you want about the franchise, you know, moving to exclusivity on the PS4, but it doesn't matter. That game is still the, you know, the cream of the crop when it comes to fighting games. All right, as far as what I bring to the Nintendo Power Zone, uh, I'm going to keep doing the same things I've always been doing. I'm going to turn it up to 11, though. I'm going to keep editing this show. Uh, I'm going to make sure the edits are cleaner. You know, the, the audio sounds better. I'm going to make sure that this show is the highest quality. And this is why we don't go live, because the house phone always rings. <laughs> um, I'm going to keep making this show, you know, as high quality as I possibly can. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I always bring content that is worth listening to. Content is key, not just for the YouTube page, but content is key for this podcast. We're not going to sit there and talk about trash. This show, you know, when I started this show with Mario After Party, the goal was to just have conversations about stuff we were already talking about. And it turned out that the stuff we were talking about was interesting. And now I'm going to be doing that same thing with the group of awesome new gentlemen who are going to make sure that the content it, that they bring is also equally as good as the stuff that I'm bringing to the table. And that's why I brought these three young, these three young men onto the show because I believe that they all have qualities that are going to make this show stand out in a way that it hasn't yet done. Um, as far as my goals, I only got one goal. I want to make this the number one Nintendo podcast. I want to beat IGN. I want to beat Puckle. I want to beat Nintendo World Report. I want to beat them all. That's my goal. And it's a lofty goal, and those podcasts are a lot more established. But we're here to, to throw out the challenge. And this isn't shit talking. I respect each and every one of those podcasts and all the people who are involved in making those podcasts. But I want to be able to say that when you listen to the N Nintendo Power Zone, you are getting the best Nintendo-related content. So those are the goals for the show. They haven't changed. We're just ramping it up to 11. That's why there are three people here. And now, that's my introduction. Now, what I want to do is I just want to talk a little bit about why we have three new hosts instead of one. And I'm going to unmute everybody's mic just so they can weigh in as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason <laughs> the reason we have three new co-hosts, not just one, is because in order to deliver, you know, a strong, well-rounded, well-balanced podcast, it requires many points of views. Now I will say this: the problem with the old system when it was just me and Mario After Party is Mario After Party is my best friend in the whole world. I have known him since the tenth grade. And he moved to Florida because I live in Florida. That is how close our friendship is. That's how close the bond we have always had is. We've worked together, you know, on this podcast. We have worked together making music. And if you guys haven't heard it, you can look it up. Mara After Party, nice one. Spelled N-Y-C-E with the number one. There's music out there on YouTube that we have created. We have worked together in a number of capacities. But more, more, more deeper than that is the fact that we have been friends for longer than, you know, most people are married. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Think about that what you will. But the, the thing is, because we're such close friends, we share a lot of similar opinions. So there wasn't a lot of dissension. Like, it sometimes it just sounded like this show was fanboy, you know, glossing. And I can admit to that. And there's nothing wrong with that because with all the hate Nintendo gets... There needed to be some positivity, but we were as objective as possible. We literally had an episode called What's Wrong with the Wii U. But still, by adding three, I'm, you know, I'm bringing more perspectives 
to the show, which means you have more opinions to, you know, to listen to. And, you know, JB's opinion might be different from Jaden's. And Brenda's opinion might be different than everybody's. And that's something that's going to make for fantastic listening. When there is a little bit of a disagreement, as long as we handle that disagreement respectfully, that's great content. Mm -hmm. That being said, there's another reason why there's three. Something that Mario After Party and myself always had trouble managing was schedules. Um, you know, that's why it's part of the reason why we record so late in the month. Um, one of the many reasons. But scheduling can be something of an issue. And it's nobody's fault. You know, we have lives, we have families, wives, girlfriends, life. Life is life. And because of life, scheduling something like this, especially when I'm asking somebody to dedicate anywhere between two and three hours of their time, that can be difficult. With the Council of Game Masters, what I was able to do was basically build the schedule from now until January. And basically, these are the, these are the topics that we're going to discuss. Whoever can be available on this date will be on the show. Now, if it just means one person will be on the show, that's fine. If it means all three of them are on the show, even better. But this podcast will now be handled by the council. We all have equal responsibilities uh, as far as the content that we're going to bring. We have equal hosting duties. And in the event that I am sick or I am doing something because I do intend on getting married, one of these things might conflict with my personal schedule these young men are all responsible enough to take up and bring you content. Now, as you guys know, I have done this show throwing up. I would do my best to be on the show, but like, I don't feel the pressure that I felt before to appear on the show. These guys can all get on here, follow the content that's listed out, and they can make an awesome show for you guys. And that's why we have the council. So again, I want to go ahead and I want to thank all of them for being here, especially on this debut episode, because it was it took some doing, but we all got here. And, you know, don't expect us all to be on the show at once, guys. Like I said, this is rotational. Whoever can be on the show will be on the show. And like I said, the more the merrier. You know, mm -hmm. clearly we're not having any audio issues Everything is functioning properly. The video is working. So okay. this is a new era for the Nintendo Power Zone. And I, like I said, guys, welcome the new host to the Nintendo Power Zone. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, Great to be here. <laughs> all right. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to keep things rolling. And we're going to talk about what we plan to do here in season three because this is our third season so you guys are just joining you're the new cast members but we've discussed it a bunch we know what we're going to do from now pretty much up until january so what we're, we're going to just go ahead we're going to run through the plans real quick so everybody knows that next month is our two-year anniversary show and mm -hmm. i'm really excited to you know tell you guys that there's we're going to have guest appearances on the show the guys know who it is. I just can't quite confer them yet. They are confirmed, but I won't confirm them on the show just because of scheduling. Um, mm. But I promise you guys, I have reached out to the larger Nintendo community, and what is going to happen is one of the best shows that we have ever done. So it's basically going to break down like this. We are going to have a standard episode next month. But in addition to that, we're going to appearances as well so it's gonna be roughly a three and a half hour episode guys if things are you know are handled correctly but the guests that we have coming onto the show they're gonna blow your minds this is you know I I'm really happy at at to at a how much the overall Nintendo fan community embraced us now we're talking to youtubers other podcasters it's going to be an amazing show and it's gonna be it's gonna be a worthy celebration of our two year anniversary. <clears throat> um, I, go ahead. I think that you're definitely right. Keeping it like you guys are gonna be so surprised and like you said, blown away by these guest appearances. 
I'm super excited to have them on the show, so it's been super cool. Uh, so look forward to that, because I'm looking forward to it. All right. Um, as far as the, the content for the majority of that episode is going to be, we're going to be doing a little bit of a deep dive uh, into Mario Rabbids. Um, so we're going to be... Obviously, the game comes out tomorrow, August 29th, as we're recording here on the 28th. I think everybody here on the on the podcast is going to be participating in that. So we're definitely going to be talking about Mario Rabbids, a little bit of a deep dive. Um, in October, we're going to be talking about Metroid, the Pokemon Tournament. So, guys, you guys know how I felt about Pokemon Tournament. You know how much I loved it. But this is a new version of the game. So we're going to deep dive a little bit of that as much as we can. And then we're going to talk about Metroid Return of Samus. Because uh, I don't think there's a single person in this room that isn't, you know, super excited about that game. <clears throat> the return of Metroid for the first time in, shoot, nearly a decade has it been? It's the been last almost one was seven years. Something Metroid. like that. It was Fusion, right? No, wasn't it Other M? Other oh, M. Wii. 2D. I thought. Other M was on the Wii. That wasn't 10 years ago. It was close to that. <laughs> it was seven really? years ago. I looked it up the other really? day. Two. Okay. I I'm got my timelines all wrong. And Metroid, Metroid Fusion, though, that game came out. I don't even remember. That was a Game Boy Advance game. Yeah, yeah I was in high game. school when that game came out. <laughs> yeah, that was an old game. Fantastic. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but, man... Poor, yeah. poor, poor Metroid. Poor Samus. Yeah. Well, the worst has done her it, wrong. Uh, the worst part about it is that Fusion is technically the last game in mm -hmm. the Metroid in the timeline. timeline. Yeah. Timeline. Yeah. So we what have no next? idea. We have no idea how like she's going to be treated mm -mm. after she's fused with a freaking Metro. We have no mm -mm. idea. So no. I'm excited to talk about the changes that they've made to you know the Return of Samus. That's a game I yeah. played on the Super NES, and mm -hmm. I'm actually looking forward to playing that again on the Super NES Classic when it comes out. I am um, so stoked. Who, by show of hands, who got who got a uh, NES Classic pre-ordered? Yeah. No, um, I, I'm I need to save money. Just be in a new apartment. I can't get it. I wish I could. Oh man. I want to talk about the debacle later on when we oh, get to yeah, the news. Oh, yeah, they recalled all the pre-orders, right? Yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about that debacle in the news section. Um, yeah. So October is kind of going to be a weird month. Um, yeah. We're going to talk about uh, the Pokemon I Choose You movie. Oh, I'm, wait, I'm sorry, in November, I said October, in November. We're going to do a breakdown of that movie, and possibly, just depending on the release date, we're going to talk about Pokemon Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon. Uh, just, <laughs> just early experiences on that game. Um, cause I'm not going to plow through a Pokemon game. That is not how you enjoy one. But I want to talk briefly about the changes they've made to that game. December. Guys, you know the drill for December. December is our annual year in review. This will be our third annual year in review. Uh, and we're just going to basically talk about the year as a whole. I hope to get everybody on for that specific episode because with a new audience and new cast members, I want to make sure that we thoroughly talk about the year. And I'm going to try to get Mario After Party on that episode as well. Normally, he's here live in studio for that. So I'm going to see if I can get him on here. And we're going to, you know, if we can, we're going to run this show five men deep. And that's going to be an awesome, uh, you know, thing to do. Just talk Nintendo with four mm -hmm. other dudes and just talk about whether the year was a success or not. I mean, I'm pretty sure we can all say it has been, but. You know, whenever until they hatch. You already know, because when we do these year reviews, sometimes like we go into the year thinking it was bad, and then it ended up being a great year. Mm -hmm. So it it is what it is. And then, guys, for January, and we're gonna cut things off at January just because we have more planning to do. But that's gonna be our Super Mario Odyssey deep dive. Uh, we do our deep dives for games like this late because we want the audience to beat the game as well. Uh, and it's going to take me about until January to beat that game, just being honest. Um, but we're going to deep dive Super Mario Odyssey. It's going to be our spoiler cast. And that's going to be a big, fun episode because who doesn't freaking love Mario? Mm -hmm. All right. So, guys, we're going to take a five-minute recess. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Nintendo news. Not a whole lot this month, but we've got some stuff to cover, and we'll be right back.
Welcome back to the Internet Power Zone. Guys, I am one of your four hosts, Nice1983. Joining me are Brendan, Jaden, and Jay Brilliant. Hey, you. So, guys, we're going to go ahead. We're going to slide into the Powered Up News. We've got a couple of news stories this month. It was actually a relatively slow Nintendo month. Um, mm-hmm. That being said, I think we got some exciting stuff to talk about. So, moving on to the first story. The Nintendo World Championships 2017 edition. Uh, super excited about this. It's We've only had two Nintendo World Championships. We had the one back in 1990 uh, that ran across 26 cities across the U.S. And that was a bigger event, obviously. And then in 2015 at E3, they brought them back, and they really showcased and highlighted a, a couple of games. Uh that Metroid Federation Force with the uh, Blast Ball. Mm-hmm. Y'all have opinions about that? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to say Blast Ball wasn't the best. Federation Force could have been fun in the right settings. I, I own it. I played it a bit. It wasn't the best, but it wasn't what I wanted. But it was like fun in the right setting with like, three friends on a couch. You know? It's cool I that way. I forgot it existed, honestly. My copy is still sealed. I have not even opened it. Oh, wow. Which is interesting. Which, which, which makes me sad, because I was actually interested in it. The concept was was interesting. It reminded me a lot of like the multiplayer for the DS version of the Metroid Prime game. Mm-hmm. Prime was, Hunters, yeah. Yeah, it was fucking fantastic. That yeah. was an incredibly underrated game. Mm-hmm. Absolutely underrated. All but, right. Um, yeah. But back to the Nintendo World Championships, though. Um, I think it's weird that we're having it because think about it, we've only had the one in 1990 and the one in 2015. 25 year gap, why have one randomly two years after the last one? I feel like there's got to be something big to go with it, is, in, is my opinion on it. Like, so you're going to just have it randomly in 2017? It's not an anniversary and it's not anything really. So it's not even like after E3, like the last one was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it was E3 yeah. intro, so it made sense. Mm-hmm. But now it's just like random, yeah. Well, they used it to showcase, you know, uh, Super Mario Maker, which they did. They, they did in a fantastic way by making mm-hmm. that the final game event. Yeah. Personally, I feel like they're going to show off a game. You don't have the World Championships and don't bring something new to the table. Now, we've yeah. got some great games that they could possibly compete in. Um, as far as the qualifying is concerned, there are eight cities that are participating in the qualifiers. Yeah. Um, None of them near me. I actually, I'm pretty close. To, I could drive to Miami. It's about a four-hour drive. Um, but, there, man. So the cities that are going to be taking place are New York, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. They had their qualifiers on August 19th and 20th. On the 26th and 27th, uh, so this weekend, Yeah. you had the Chicago and L.A. September 2nd and 3rd. Minneapolis and Dallas, mm-hmm. September 9th and 10th, Seattle and Miami, and I'm fairly certain these are the same cities that participated uh, for the 2015 World Championships. I think so. Um, uh, I could have gone to the Chicago, but I was busy moving in, and I'm like, shoot. But <laughs> I well, might I go to say, I kind of like the fact that they're doing uh, World Championships more frequently. It makes the mm-hmm. thing like if anybody watches wrestling. I mean, the reason why they, mm. they fought belts all the time is to give it prestige, you know? Yeah, um, no, I agree. I want them more, too, especially with um, Nintendo wanting to go to the eSports field of games. Yeah. I think it'd be great. Um, so I want them more, too. It just seemed it weird. So, but with this one, uh, from what I've been reading, it's, it's they're doing it on Mario Kart 7 for the 3DS, which is kind of strange. For, I, I think it was Mario for the Kart. kids' version. That like the juniors oh, qualifiers, right? Yeah. Well, it's the same game for the juniors and for the you know above. But what they're gonna do is, um, you know, they have different courses and different mm-hmm. characters to race. So, the juniors will be racing as Luigi with standard kart, standard wheel, and they'll be racing on a specific track, oh. and they'll be racing time trials. Uh, and then for the adults, they're gonna be racing on Luigi's Mansion uh, as a I'm sorry, not Luigi. They're going to be racing Bowser Bowser Castle. Castle, Yeah. 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 But it seems that they're doing Mario Kart, which is interesting, because I figured they'd do the newer Mario Kart. Yeah. But they're doing Mario Kart 7. So um, 
But what I think is good about this is taking old game that's already been out is it feels less like a marketing ploy and True. more like an actual tournament. Yeah. So I think that's a good angle. I, I like that. That's a point, yeah. Well, and I think what's cool about it is is that it's not a game that we're likely to see them actually compete in during the main oh, event in October. Yeah. So we'll probably we'll probably see a version of Mario Kart, most likely mm-hmm. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. We'll yeah. definitely I'm pretty sure we'll see uh Arms, um Splatoon. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, yeah. and maybe maybe just hoping just you know, maybe some Street Fighter. And I think they're gonna close <laughs> this thing out. I, like I said, I believe they're gonna showcase something. I'm gonna say it right mm-hmm. here, right now. They're gonna announce Smash DX as the final game that they play as to I win the whole championship. I'm I expecting think, it at this point. I think with the confirmation of the World Championships, I think it's a good place to have it. You're right. Although yeah. I almost want to say it is still too soon. Then I, I want to say at this point they're not gonna do a straight port. I think they might be working on five, actually. But they could just do the port. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so just a couple little more odd pieces about this. So Best Buy has confirmed that they're getting a crap ton of switches for this mm-hmm. event. So if you want to switch and you can make it to one of these eight cities, you should go. Uh, second, if you are a My Nintendo Rewards member, uh, if you check in with your QR co- uh, with a QR code, you're gonna get a hundred platinum points, and the first two hundred people to these events will receive a My Nintendo pin. Just a little button. It's kind of nice. Kind of want to go. Um, yeah. And it's just a nice way to to keep building momentum. This is, in my opinion, this is more about brand recognition than it mm-hmm. is really about, you know, advertising like a uh, new hardware. Yeah. They want to do something to keep them in people's mind's eye. They, they've had a, Nintendo's had mm-hmm. a spectacular year thus far. The Switch has been far more successful than a lot of people wanted to give it credit for. This yeah. is a really good way for them to just keep some momentum going. And especially in a time where it looks like the game releases are starting to slow down, even though they're not because we still have, obviously we have Rabbits tomorrow. Mm-hmm. We have Pokemon in September. We mm-hmm. have Xenoblade, Fire Emblem Warriors, and we still have Super Mario Odyssey. So we got we got games coming yeah. out. It just seems like the the level of hype between those games is a little bit more tempered than you know for the early half of the year where it was yeah. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and Splatoon 2 and Arms. Like mm-hmm. yeah, we're a little bit more titles. tempered. Yeah, we're a little bit more tempered up until Odyssey's release, but plenty of games still to come. All right, moving on from that, this next story was only a matter of time before it went down. Nintendo has a history of litigation. They are always being sued or suing somebody. This goes back to Donkey Kong. Universal Studios sued Nintendo over copyright infringement for Donkey Kong, and since then, they have been sued left and right. And in Mm -hmm. in a brand new case, brought by uh, Game Vice, they are suing Nintendo over the Joy-Cons. They're mm-hmm. saying that the Joy-Cons infringe on their patent for their uh, mm. the, the Game Vice, uh, what is it called? The Wikipad. So the Wikipad yeah. is a tablet device that has these two separate controllers that are attached by uh, some kind of a I guess it's elastic or plastic or maybe even vinyl. They're attached by vinyl, so it's like one yeah. solid piece, and the controller actually slides into it, whereas the Joy-Cons are separate controllers that individually dock to each side of the Switch's tablet. Mm-hmm. They're saying that this is copyright infringement, and they want Nintendo to cease all productions of the Nintendo Switch and turn over all profits netted from this. Now, I don't want to be super biased here, but I'm looking at the game vice right now, the wiki pad. I'm looking at the mm-hmm. wiki pad, and what am I? What does it look like? In my opinion, it looks like the Wii U game pad. It looks exactly like the Wii U game pad. The button layout it looks like a worse version of it. Yeah, like they copied it as much as they could without mm-hmm. uh, directly stealing the, yeah. the design entirely. But the button layout is exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the screen size is exactly the same. Now, well, the screen size could be a phone, right? It well, yeah. most devices. Well, for the Wikipad itself, it's a tablet. But they, because the Wikipad didn't take off, it was mm-hmm. kind of a. 
it didn't really up, and nobody bought on, bought this essentially. Yeah. Uh, they decided that they had to recoup the development costs by making cell phone versions and making mm -hmm. tablet versions. So there's a there's literally a version of the of mm -hmm. the uh, of the game vice attachments for all major tablets. That being said, though, like right. the concept is very similar. It is a you know the switch is a tablet that has docking controllers. Yeah. This this is a tablet with a docking controller. Um, but whether or not it's infringement is is a is a completely different story. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Nintendo isn't gonna take it lying down. They're gonna they're gonna lawyer up if they haven't already. And I'm no. I mean, it's been about a month since this news broke, so mm -hmm. I'm fairly certain they've lawyered up. But uh, yeah. Just my personal opinion on this. I don't think it's similar enough to be infringement uh, because the thing about the Joy-Cons and the Joy-Cons function as separate individual controllers. You can take a Joy, you can take one half of the Joy-Con, and that functions as a controller. You cannot do that with the Wiki Pad. It is one mm -hmm. solid controller. Um, while they, like I said, similar concepts, but in practice they function entirely differently. Um, that being said. Who has any real other uh, maybe dissenting opinions on this? Um, I think it, it is a kind of a stretch. There are similar in concept, but even then, there's a lot of differences. And then, like you said, how it plays out when you actually make the device, it is very different. Um, I think it's not the Joy-Con is like like you said, a whole controller in one. It, it's modular almost, and this is some of these like the phone ones are modular, but. I, I don't see enough resemblance in terms of concept even to, to say that it's a, an infringement just off of my opinion and execution definitely not and I think it's definitely like people will sue big companies trying to make it like a little extra money but having to cease all switch and hand over all profits is just that's a bit extreme I feel I feel like that's going too far maybe um, especially like it's their, it's Nintendo's new, like, favorite child right now is, well, is the Switch. So well, honestly, you gotta, what? you got you gotta think that they are lawyering up to protect it. This is their money maker right now. Is the Switch? They're going to protect it. They have investments in, it, so they gotta protect it. So they're gonna lawyer up for sure, and and I do think they're gonna win. Uh, and I think if they make it a long lawsuit, like the three DS, uh, lawsuit just ended basically. And, and so they can continue the switch until they win the till um game by switchy pad wins the um <clears throat> the lawsuit. So I don't know. Well, and I think something that's kind of been lost is the switch isn't really proprietary hardware for Nintendo. I mean, the and switch is more of a joint you know product with Nvidia. Yeah. This is based on the mm -hmm. Nvidia Shield. So true. Yeah. I, the NVIDIA Shield was also a portable, open-source tablet device. Yeah. Um, so I don't see NVIDIA listed in this lawsuit. Uh, no. But if GameVice really wanted to pursue litigation, they, I, I believe they also would be, should be, if they're trying to do this properly, be going after, after NVIDIA, NVIDIA as, as well. well because you know it's, it's a NVIDIA's concept just as much as it is Nintendo's because it's Obviously, the Switch is built on the NVIDIA infrastructure. This is the whole reason why NVIDIA canceled mm -hmm. their next tablet device because they they did this joint partnership with Nintendo to build, you know, an awesome game device. Yeah. Although yeah, I can't really see these charges sticking, to be honest. I'm not a legal expert, but, you know, Nintendo has a long history of just being sued. Yeah. They're the big dogs on top. They've been sued by Atari. They've been sued by uh, Philips for over the Wiimote. Um, they were sued over the me characters. Uh, now, you know, now courts tend to be strange sometimes, and you know, I guess there is uh, an off possibility that they may side with game buys. But I mean, you could always, uh, in dumb businesses like that, they tend to be able to. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They uh, like retrial. Um, uh, I'm blanking on the appeal. right word. Appeal. Appeal. That's the right word. They can appeal, and usually when they've appealed, like for example, the Philips one with the Wiimote, mm -hmm. Philips won the first one, but they appealed, and Nintendo managed to come on top the, once they appealed it. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't see it really honestly sticking. 
No. I, I, honestly, I think the 3DS case went all the way up to, you know, the Supreme Court as far as yeah. what, what the ruling would be on that. And it, maybe even the Japanese Supreme Court, if I'm not mistaken, I think that went... I, I think that, that one took a toll on Nintendo because that was yeah. a lot of... There was a lot of uh, stuff Money to... Money spent on lawyers and legal oh, fees. Well, the whole thing is that you, you're... You, the the 3D concept is something Nintendo's been technically toying with since the uh, GameCube. Yeah, they've been they've been trying to make 3D happen for a while. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, just to you know, I felt like if Nintendo had kept more of their ducks in order, that lawsuit probably wouldn't have gone as long as it did because they've been That's they've been messing point. with that for a while. Yeah, Our, but they're finicky. Sometimes they just want to side with the underdog, which sounds shitty, but. That's the world we live in, folks. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we have appeal processes. Yeah. All right. Now, lastly, I just want to briefly touch on this. Uh, Super NES Classic. Yeah. All right. So, by show of hands, we, we determined earlier that only 50% of the members of this podcast were able to nab one. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, Jaden, but my... My story for the Super NES Classic was a freaking nightmare. So I stayed up all night, just randomly, when the pre-orders went live on Amazon. And when I got the tweet that they were live on Amazon, I went to go pre-order it. Mm -hmm. went, to the, went to the page, tried to click it, this item not available. But yet somehow people have Nintendo S Super uh, NES Classics bought and pre-ordered and all that good stuff. And I'm like, what the hell? Only to find out that Amazon created a separate page from the listing yep. that they previously had. Never oh. more pissed. I almost canceled my Prime membership over that. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, right. That's uh, typical that's Amazon a, crap. Sneaky. Yeah. So, I got mad. Mm -hmm. I decided, fuck it. I'm going to bed. Went to bed at 2. Woke up at 5 a.m. to take my fiance to work. Mm-hmm. Woke up at 6 a.m., I'm sorry. At 5 a.m., Best Buy's pre-orders had gone live. Okay. And they sold out in roughly 20 minutes, so yeah. that's two pre-orders. Next morning, I'm like, okay, all the retailers are supposedly going to do it. I went to GameStop.com, Target.com, Walmart.com. The only one I was able to get my SNES Classic in the cart was Target.com. Hmm. And just as I was about to confirm my pre-order... The site nabbed. The site crashed. Oh, that, that's bad. No. So I'm like, oh my god, this is a freaking nightmare. Go to GameStop.com. Their website doesn't even open. They're completely crashed. GameStop tweets at 1.15 p.m. We have physical pre-orders. I got in the car. Oof. I drove 90 miles an hour to my local GameStop. <laughs> and I was the 10th person in line and when I got my pre-order confirmed they told everybody behind me he was the last one we have oh. no more pre-orders never ran out of a GameStop so fast in my life <laughs> that man is walking dead <laughs> get him <laughs> yeah my buddy um, he had a very similar story lost out on a lot of the onlines but then he went to GameStop he was number 5 in line and he was the last one at that store. Uh, it was like they're all super close, like five, ten pre-orders, five pre-orders. They're limited quantities for sure. With Nintendo, it's always going to be that way, I guess. At this point, super unfortunate. But yeah, like very similar story to my friend. This is a nightmare. But mm -hmm. what I want to talk about is why is this nightmare happening again? Yeah, that you'd think they would learn, and it, the parts, the, the materials for the Switch, I understand, like, Apple needs them, so there's the whole, like, supply and demand plus materials, but for the Super Premium Mini, it, sh it shouldn't, or Classic, it shouldn't take that, resources should be there for it. No, I mean, resources should be there. So it's all, it's all built in house, you know. With mm -hmm. the, yeah, it's production manuf facilities too. With the same manufacturers that they messed with when they were messing with the, when they were doing the NES Classic. Mm -hmm. But this is the problem: Nintendo supply and demand is way off the charts. It's like they don't like making yeah. money. Like there's, there's, this is a money maker. This is a huge mm -hmm. thing. This capitalizes yeah. on things like nostalgia and. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
it clearly pays homage, and the system itself has some amazing features, like yes. the rewind feature, like the save state, mm -hmm. you know, the CRT modes, all these great things that mm -hmm. this device can do, and yet, just trying to get your hands on one is such a nightmare, and I get it. Yeah. Nintendo likes to create sort of a false demand. Like yeah. They, they've been doing that since the 80s. Like, if you yeah. guys, if anybody's read or listened to Console Wars, you get a big insight onto Nintendo's practices as to yeah. fulfilling orders. But yeah. it's 2017 now, and when it looks like when you're trying to capitalize on the nostalgia factor of you know of a consumer, you need to make these devices more readily available. And yeah. I, for one, like I said, my experience getting one was just as bad as making sure I had an NES Classic. So. Yeah. I just want to call Nintendo out on their shit for a little bit. It's like, I love Nintendo. You listen to this podcast, you know I love Nintendo, but God freaking damn it. Get your shit together, Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Like, this isn't the Wii. I, and like like Brennan said, it, the Switch is a forgivable offense. Mm -hmm. There is no way that you could actually accommodate the demand that the Switch actually has uh, with the amount of time that you, you, know, you led into it with. It wasn't a whole lot of lead up from October to March. That's not a whole lot of lead up. This is the system. You see it. This is how many we have. That's it. And you know, they you have to work around all the obstacles that come out with launching a new console. But these aren't issues that PlayStation has. These aren't mm -hmm. issues that, you know, you know, the Xbox have. They release consoles and they have plenty of them. Yeah. Um, now I get it. Niche market, who's going to be purchasing the SNES Classic, but I think I saw one on eBay going for fifteen hundred dollars. Oh, that's disgusting! It's not going to sell for that much. It's probably a ploy to uh, to placeholder. Uh, it'll probably drop once they actually get the systems in their hands. Maybe um, I would be shocked if it really sold for fifteen hundred. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I get it. Like the the scalping market for this is bad. I mean, uh, yeah. This is like Amiibo all over again. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a complicated um, chain of events. Part of it is the manufacturing process. Uh, the yeah. way things are manufactured just globally, it's different than what we expect. A lot of people tend to think that Nintendo, um, you know, has their own plant just in their backyard in the great land of the rising sun. And typically not that way. Um, most of it the way manufacturing's done is it's all done in China or, yeah. you know, Vietnam or Thailand or, you know, that, that sort of area. And what we find out is that companies, they share the plants. So, you know, Nintendo will, will, will put in an order and say, look, I need this many units in this amount of time. Huh. And after that, someone else will come in an order. And, so one of the things that we'll see happen is once they go through those orders, um, if, if, if a company finds out, shit, we're understocked, we need more, it's not easy to simply just say, hey, get me more right now. Because they have a long list, a long laundry list of other companies that are already in line. Not to mention the fact that they also have to swap out the uh, the machines to manufacture these parts. And the way I know this is because I kickstarted um, a couple of different physical um, goods, and they ran into the same problem. One of them, they found defects, and so that added an extra six months on to the uh, the time to manufacture mm. uh, because they just had to put in another order, and they had to wait in line. Yeah, it it's very complicated. And it, it, it kind of comes out to Nintendo of America gets to determine, you know, the the order amount. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. As a as a subsidiary of Nintendo, it is actually pretty much run as its own separate entity. Yeah. Um, Nintendo of America has never been big on ordering a lot of stuff because with Nintendo of America, their success and their failures, they're bigger because they're smaller. They operate, you know, the the cost that they, they would operate a loss at 
would hit them financially much harder than it would hit, you know, Nintendo of Japan as a large corporation. Like Nintendo of Japan yeah. is worth billions of dollars. Nintendo of America probably somewhere north of a hundred million as far That's as operating that. operating costs are concerned. So they have to fundamentally be a little bit more frugal with what they do. But at the same time, when you're when you're um when you're marketing towards nostalgia, mm -hmm. that's a like you have to you have to have a little bit more foresight than what I feel like they're yeah. actually bringing to the table. Um, nostalgia's rough though, because it, you know you can only write off a nostalgia so far. You you see that nostalgia comes in waves. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So one year nostalgia will be big and things will be selling off the market. Uh, selling off the shelves, and then the next year people are just done with nostalgia and they want to go towards the future. I so agree. it's always kind of part. I agree, but we're in this, we're in a world now where retro gaming is just as popular as, you know, Modern. new, new top, yeah. top AAA titles. I mean, look at Sonic Mania. Yeah. Look at Sonic Perfect Mania. Game. And it, that game is already on its way to being it's it for me i walked into this year thinking that birth of the wild was going to be the best game of the year mm -hmm. that was it nothing was going to top that and i've played sonic mania and i'm like fuck it sonic mania is a contender it's a small yeah. game it's not a big game mm -mm. but what? the nostalgia of it has you know retro gamers you know they're ready to go i mean look look at look at the table guys if you're watching the video version of this cast <laughs> I've got my Sonic Mania Collector's Edition statue right next to my Mario figure. Mm -hmm. the retro gaming, it 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 almost the the nostalgia factor of retro gaming is is powerful, it, especially with classic Nintendo IP. When it comes to video games and video game characters, if you ask somebody to name a video game character, nine times out of ten they're gonna say Mario first. Mm -hmm. Like. Or Donkey Kong, or any one of the other amazing Nintendo IP. Nintendo has the richest IP. It's it's almost shameful that they don't necessarily understand that at all times. Mm -mm. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, it's a debacle. We're gonna have to yeah. see what launch day actually looks like uh, yeah. as far as retail is concerned. I honestly. I, I don't know. They they keep saying that there's going to be plenty on hand, but talking to a few GameStop employees, they're a lot more skeptical. Um, yeah. You know, Walmart, Target, Toys R Us employees, they won't even come close to divulging any <laughs> any of those secrets with you. But GameStop seems a little bit more skeptical. Um, they're a little bit more tempered. Uh, yeah. and so, they have to be. What I think is probably going to happen is they're going to limit um, production initial launch, and then they're going to flood the shelves for winter. That's what I think. Bye. See, that's kind of what I'm hoping. Because they had the NES Mini, which is just like unobtainable. But yeah. even after. So I think they, if they want the false demand, this is a good strategy. I don't like it, but I think it's what I'm hoping they do. Yeah. So there's also a thing that retailers do is sometimes they'll pre-order... Um, they'll only they'll limit their pre-orders that they take in at a conservative number because sometimes they don't know the exact number of units they'll yeah. get. They get ballpark estimates, but they don't know the exact number. Yeah. And so that is also um, an issue that could come up too. That's the point. Yes. All right. So and then there's things like GameStop, which uh, so so I used to work for GameStop when I was doing my undergraduate. Right, uh, worked there for like four or five years, so it's uh, I I know a little bit about it. Um, one of the things GameStop is kind of notorious for is that they hold on to units and they sell them later at uh, bundles. For example, we saw about a month ago, uh, GameStop sold the NES Classic in a big bundle off of ThinkGeek. Yeah, I don't know if you guys I, saw that. I did or, see that. In the Wii era, they held they, they intentionally held on to copies of the Metroid Prime Trilogy and Xenoblade Chronicles so that they could sell them at like eighty bucks a pop used. And then not I think last month the Amazon truck was rolling around through about six different states. 
the Amazon truck was supposedly full of NES classics. Yeah. Mm. To the brim. And I'm like, uh, how do you have some? Because yeah. you guys can't even fill pre-orders. Yeah. NES or yeah. Super NES classic? The NES classic. Like, NES classic. Huh. Yeah, they had them last month. Uh, it was all over my Twitter feed. So anybody who was in, you know, Atlanta, uh, San Francisco, uh, Dallas, and a few other states, they were able to find the Amazon truck, get, you know, literally just walk up to it, get an NES classic. And they had a bunch. I saw pictures of the truck. I was like, that is so highly upsetting. It is, yeah, shoot. The other problem is, I think retailers share, shoulder a large burden of responsibility for this. Because, you know, uh, it's nice that Amazon, only after the fact, are starting to reduce orders of multiple copies down to one. They announced that, like, a few days ago, that accounts where they did take, uh, where they had, like, four orders, they were reducing the one. That's good, but, you know, they should limit the one per person. Yeah. They really should. If they really cared about this, then they, they should limit it. But they don't care. They just want the money. It, it's all about the money for them. Um, which sucks, but that's the way it is, you know? Yeah. And bots are a big thing, too. If anyone who has dabbled in scripting, you know, it's it's not terribly difficult to, to write a bot that can... Add shit into your cart and sell it and buy it instantly. You know that's how these scalpers yeah. do it. Forbes actually ran a uh, ran an article uh, last week uh, yeah. talking about uh, they had ten people in the office who were intentionally trying to pre-order the Super NES classics. The five people who were running bots all secured one. The five people who weren't did not. Yeah, that's really interesting. So yeah, it was on Forbes. If I I should have linked it hmm. to this, but uh, this is kind of an off the cuff, cuff uh, last minute topic that I just hmm. wanted to talk about. I talked about it briefly in uh, in my in my powered up news uh, video, but I didn't want to touch on it too much there. I wanted to talk about it a little bit more here. That being said, not too happy with the process, and we already know that a patent for the N sixty four classic has a floated its way around Europe, so it's pretty much... Con well, it was a patent for an N64 controller, so we pretty much know that means that the N64 Classic is coming probably next year. Uh, oh, but that's, it, that's... And that's the console that I'm I'm really looking forward to. Um, because you know, I, hope 64. They, I hope they give us Donkey Kong 64. Which, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, it's, that's in a weird grade, to, grade area because it's um, the rare, rare, rare. But, but um, I also hope they give us uh, the old classic 90s shells. You know what I'm talking about? The clear ones, like the atomic purple. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, that would be, oh, that would just be mm, yeah. so good. Like a choice of colors, though, right? Yeah, that would be cool. Probably not going to happen, but I mean... Yeah, stocks is bad enough, probably, with that. So. Fantastic. See, I hope it has, like, a rumble pack accessory that slides into the bottom of the controller. That would right. be nice. Oh, That'd wait, be... what about the memory cards? I hope they've got some internal memory, because I really don't want to have to be sliding a memory card into <laughs> the bottom of that controller. I, I think they'll be internal. Yeah. yeah, I feel like they'll build it into the controllers if they decide to go that route. Mm -hmm. It'll just make more sense. Cost less. Yeah. But then again, yeah. Nintendo is notorious for um, accessory selling. So. True. We'll Ooh. see. I want Pokemon Stadium and Pokemon Snap on an N64 Classic, by the way. That would be yeah. sick. Pull out those old cartridges and, you know, stick them in. All right. So I think that's all we have for the uh, Powered Up News. Right. So let's, uh, let's hit up our closing thoughts. Uh, I want to go first. Um, so, guys, I know we didn't talk a lot of Nintendo on this episode. We pretty much only talked about the news this month. Uh, that's You don't have to worry. That's not something that is going to happen on the show often. But it was really important to give these three young men their time, the time to introduce themselves, time for you to get to you know hear their opinions, time for you to get to know what they want to bring to this podcast because uh -huh. this is a new era for the podcast. This is a new Nintendo Power Zone. Um, 
no, we're not going to change the name again. Promise. <laughs> we're not going to go back to the Splat Zones, and we're not going to call it, you know, Super Nintendo Power Zone. This is still the Nintendo Power Zone. Um, but it's a new, it's a new era. This is season three, and in season three, the changes that we're bringing are people. And I mm-hmm. hope that you guys are willing to treat these people with the same amount of respect that you treated myself and my after party with during the first two years of its run. I promise you that with these three young men, we're going to be bringing so much awesome. Like we've already laid out what we have from now till January. And I, all that content has me super excited. So mm-hmm. I know that you guys should all be excited. Uh, as far as you guys, uh, how do you feel about the way this show went down today? How are you feeling about how the, about the content that we have in the near future and just what are your overall thoughts of, of being here on this podcast? You know, I think it's great. I think I'm really excited. I think we got a great balance of people. Um, we got good views. I, I like the fact that I can disagree with you. Nice one. And I can disagree with Brandon and you know, yeah. we're both respect respectful to each other. I think that's great. I think, I think we got a good team here. I think JB is going to be able to bring some brilliant streaming, and I look forward to playing Monster Hunter with him. That's going to be fantastic. <laughs> All right, who's next? Um, I think this first episode went well. I think it's a good stepping stone for the audience to know us and to set things up for the future. Like you said, we have everything planned out. And I think so far that's all looking great. Uh, so I, you guys are in store for some great shows in the future. I already know. Once again, this is a great team. We have very different skill sets and not beliefs, but perspectives on things. And I think it'll it'll really help the show develop, and I'm really looking forward to that. All right, JB, it's all on you now, brother. I really like the way that this episode flowed. This is really nice. Um, the content we're going to deliver is going to be really great. I can't wait to start interacting with a lot of you guys on the streams as well, as well as the people who listen to our podcast. I'm going to try and rope you guys in when I can. I'll get a schedule together so that way if, like, say, a multiplayer game, um, I know uh, Mario Rabbit Kingdom does have some kind of multiplayer on it. I'm going to get you guys in on it. If Double Cross finally comes to the West, I'll get that for the Switch as well. It will. I'll get you, I'll get you guys in there. All four of us can be in it, and it's going to be great. That I'm looking forward to the future. Mm-hmm. All right. So, guys, we know we're, we close out this show with our social media link. So mm-hmm. let me go ahead and start this up. You can hit me up at nice1983 at gmail.com. You can hit me up on Twitter at nice1983. You can email me uh, at the at gmail.com. Check out Facebook, facebook.com slash Nintendo Power Zone. If you like watching this show live, you can catch us here on YouTube, youtube.com slash C slash Nintendo Power Zone. We got a brand new damn URL because of the fans. Thank you all for your subscriptions on YouTube. Because of you, we have a custom URL. Much, it's going to be so much easier to find us. So thank you guys for that. The guys have their own social media links to, he- to go ahead and throw out there. So uh, let's go and whoever wants to go first, hit up hit them up with your social media. So you can hit me up on my Twitter, at Jaden Winsong. Uh, it will have a link in the description. Also, you know, we're thinking about uh, opening up a Discord channel so that you, the fans, can interact with us. Uh, so look forward to that in the near future. That'll be great. And that's all I have. Um, This is kind of embarrassing. Uh, I'm still setting my social media up. So maybe next episode I might have it set up. But for now, I'm Brendan, also Blues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anything yet. I'm sorry. It's all good. Hi, hey guys. You can hit me up at jbrilliant. <laughs> Twitter. Also, you can hit me up at uh, Facebook, uh, Choose Our Hunt as well. You can find me on Twitch. I'll let you know when we're going live for the Nintendo Power Zone or on my own. Uh, just stay tuned there. Oh, yeah. And by the way, when anybody streams content, whether do they do it to the Nintendo Power Zone or their own individual Twitch profiles, I will be retweeting so you guys know when they go live. Um, so, guys, that's the Twitch the- channel is also set up to, to host uh, as well. So if I'm going to host on my channel, you you can see it on the Nintendo uh, Power Zone channel. Same thing with Jay Brilliant. Uh, he'll also be hosted. And whenever yeah. you get your setup, Brendan, uh, yeah. you'll also be hosted. So yeah. I, I plan to, yeah. 
So, guys, I'm the only one not streaming, and it's because my work schedule is already too busy. But I understand. Everybody, thank you guys for being here. Uh, audience, thank you guys for listening. Welcome these new uh, cast members to the show. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to wrap things up here. So, as always, don't get cooked. Stay off the hook. And special YouTube content, me and uh, – Jaden, we're going to talk about a little bit of Sonic Mania for somewhere around 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, so that'll be exclusive to YouTube. So we will hit you guys up later. Deuces.